This is a mechanical circuit, which is to say it's a collection of mechanical components that together are a really robust analogy for electric circuits. You've got resistors, transistors, capacitors, ammeters, batteries, inductors. It's really incredible what you can build with this thing. And for me, it's really interesting to see my intuitions about electrical circuits in physical form. Like I can feel voltages and see currents. It's called Spintronics. There's a link in the description. They're not paying me at all to make this video. I want to be clear about that. But when I saw the Kickstarter, I just knew I had to make a video about it because I love an analogy. Let's have a look at a really simple circuit. So this is the battery and this is a resistor and the two are joined together by a chain. When I charge up the battery by pulling this string, the battery then discharges its energy into the resistor. What's really cool is you can feel the resistance. Like this one, which is 100 ohms, has a certain amount of resistance. This one, which is 200 ohms, has twice that resistance. You can feel it in your hands. And look, when you put the 200 in there, the chain moves at half the speed of when the 100 was in there. So the speed of the chain is like the amps of a circuit. You can connect two resistors in series like this, and the chain moves even more slowly. You can also connect resistors in series like this, that's a bit counterintuitive at first because it kind of looks like they're in parallel, but this is what series looks like in a spintronic circuit. It's a bit like the analogy of water flowing through pipes that you often hear when talking about electronic circuits. But instead of water being pushed through pipes, it's a chain that's being pulled and it's pulling on different components. This is probably a good time to address the veritasium shaped elephant in the room. You probably saw his video where he talks about how electronic circuits really work. It's the one about the circuit that's a light second in length. It's a really important video, actually two videos because he did a follow up that I recommend you watch if you haven't already because he clears a few things up. They're important videos because it's important to keep in mind what's really going on beneath the models that we have in our heads of how things work. In the videos, he explains that the energy in a circuit is carried by the electric and magnetic fields that hug the wires and components of the circuit. And that kind of puts the lie to the hydrodynamic model, doesn't it? Because if you only have that you know, water flowing through pipes image in your head, then you're thinking, okay, so I push water at this end of the pipe, which pushes on the water next to it, which pushes on the water next to it, which pushes on the water next to it, until this bit of water falls out the other end of the pipe, and that bit of water can be used to do work. And if that's the only model that you have, then you might think, well, it's the same with electrons. I'm pushing the electrons with a voltage through this end of the wire, which pushes on the electrons in front of it, which pushes on the electrons in front of it, until eventually these electrons at the end, they could be pushed out of the wire and do work. But that's not how it works. The energy is carried by the electric and magnetic fields. Though, to be fair to the electrons, those electric and magnetic fields belong to the electrons. So it is kind of fair to say that it's the electrons that are carrying the energy. It's just that they're not pushing on each other in the way that the water in a pipe model might lead you to believe. But to make a broader philosophical point, like everything we know in science is just models. Even quantum mechanics is just a model. And it's wrong in the sense that we know it's not a true description of the universe because it doesn't play well with relativity. But we still use quantum mechanics because it's insanely accurate under most circumstances. So you might have the water in a pipe model of electric circuits in your head, but it's important to know that underneath that, it's the electric and magnetic fields that are carrying the energy. But even that's a model, right? I mean, it's models all the way down. But the point is when you're doing science, you pick the model that is most appropriate for the thing that you're doing. This mechanical circuit model is good for intuition as well. So let's explore some of those. This is the Spintronic equivalent of a capacitor. The more you try and turn it, the harder it gets to turn. In the same way that the more you try and shove charge into an actual capacitor, the harder it gets. And look, you can even see there's numbers on the dial so you can see how charged up it is. Actually, this doubles as a voltmeter, so the numbers here are in volts. A quick note on units, actually. This says 100 ohms, but actually it's 100 spin ohms. And this is spin volts. What's really nice is they're all analogous to the real things. Like if we say that 10 meters of this chain is equivalent to one coulomb of charge, then all these other values like 
spin ohms and spin volts and stuff written down here, they're all equivalent then to the real thing. Look what happens if I connect a resistor and a capacitor to the battery. You might think that these are in parallel, but look, once the capacitor is charged up, the current stops flowing through both the capacitor and the resistor. That's because this is actually a series circuit. So how do you achieve parallel circuits with Spintronics? Well, you need junctions, and actually junctions are more complicated with Spintronics than they are in electric circuits. Well, that's because they're incredibly simple in electric circuits. Look, here's a junction, but this is a junction in Spintronics. It's actually like a differential gear in a car. If I hold this still, these two things move. If I hold this one still, these two move. If I hold this one still, these two move. That means whatever voltage you apply to the bottom sprocket will actually come out of the top two sprockets and vice versa for any pair. So remember when I had these two resistors in series, they span at the same rate, just like an electric circuit, the current through two resistors in series will be the same. But look, when I put them in parallel, the smaller resistor spins much more quickly. And that's as we would expect. We expect a greater current to flow through the lower resistor. Remember, these capacitors are also voltmeters. So if I put a voltmeter in parallel with this resistor, then I'm measuring the voltage across the resistor. That's pretty cool, isn't it? One thing that's nice about a junction is you can feel the voltage. Like if I hold the top sprocket of the junction with my fingers, I can feel it pushing against me. That's the voltage. Another cool thing about junctions is that you can use them as a transformer. In this circuit, this resistor is attached to the junction twice, and this free spinning component is attached to the remaining sprocket. Powering this with my hand, I only feel half the resistance, but the resistor turns at half the speed. That's mechanical advantage. So transforming voltages in Spintronics is actually a lot easier than in regular circuits. You can easily do it with DC, whereas with electrical circuits, you need alternating current. There's even something analogous to an ammeter, a device that indicates the amps in a circuit, how much current is flowing. It doesn't give you a reading, instead it gives you a pitch. All along this rim, there are these serrations. Look, if I scrape it with my nail, you can kind of hear it. Under here, there's a ridge that is connected to this gramophone amplifier. So the faster this thing turns, the higher the pitch. If I add it to this circuit here, that gives you a sense of what the current is like. If I put it against this smaller resistor, the pitch goes up. In series with a capacitor, when I turn the switch on, you can hear how current flows quickly into the capacitor, but slows down as it gets full. With this setup, I can charge and discharge the capacitor with these two switches. This is probably my favorite component. It's an inductor. This is what an electrical inductor looks like. It's a coil of wire. And how does one of these things behave? For me, it was one of those things that wasn't super easy to get an intuition for. Like an inductor resists the buildup of current, but once there is a current, it resists the reduction of current. It's all mediated by magnetic fields, but with this Spintronics analogy, it's all about inertia and momentum, which is really intuitive. Because of these weights around here, it's hard to get the thing spinning. And once it's spinning, it's hard to stop it. Connecting an inductor to a capacitor really gives a nice intuition about both of these components and how they might behave in a circuit. Because it's hard to stop current flowing through an inductor, it can cause damage to your circuit if it's not designed well. In fact, the same thing happens with Spintronics circuits. This is a switch here, and when I turn it on, the inductor receives power. It eventually spins up, and then watch what happens when I turn the switch off. It destroys the switch. If you have a problem like that in a circuit, then you add a resistor in parallel. So now when I turn the switch off, the inductor can dump its energy through the resistor. By the way, if there's nothing connected to the battery, it spins like crazy, which is exactly what happens if you connect the two ends of a battery together. 
the battery will overheat because of the immense flow of current through it. There's a little seatbelt type brake inside to prevent damage to the Spintronics battery if there isn't anything connected. Or if you make a circuit like this and you realize that there's nothing attached to this part of the junction. Actually, that illustrates something quite quirky about Spintronics, which is that components are by default closed circuits. Like if you charge up a regular capacitor and then remove it from the circuit, it holds its charge. But look, if I charge up this Spintronics capacitor and then let go, it discharges. So unless a Spintronics component is connected to something else, it's probably connected to itself. This is really cool, it's a transistor. Look, no current can flow through this bottom sprocket because of these clamps clamping down on that rubber ring. But if I apply a small voltage to the top sprocket, it opens up these clamps and the bottom sprocket can spin. You might know that you can use a transistor as an amplifier. So a small voltage applied up here can lead to a large current flowing down here. Here it is in a circuit. This capacitor that's acting as a voltmeter here is showing the small change in voltage that I'm supplying with my fingers. This capacitor slash voltmeter is showing the much bigger amplified voltage across the load. You can even make a diode by connecting a transistor to itself via a junction. Look, it will spin one way, but not the other, just like a diode. So let's see if we can build some interesting circuits. This is a peak voltage detector. So I can apply a voltage manually with my hand and this capacitor slash voltmeter is showing me that voltage, but this capacitor slash voltmeter is showing me the peak voltage. Because this pair of components acts as a diode, the capacitor won't discharge when I let go over here. What's brilliant about all this is I can feel it as it happens. It's really intuitive. Spintronics actually comes with a dedicated diode component. So look, here's a simplified version of the circuit. The diode works by a simple ratchet mechanism. You can turn it in one direction, but not in the other. This is a high pass filter. So I can send a voltage signal into the circuit with my hand by spinning this thing. I can do it at high frequency, I can do it at low frequency. And a high pass filter will filter out the low frequency signals, leaving the high frequency signals. But how does it do that? Well, this is an inductor and it's in parallel. You can think of an inductor as a short circuit for low frequencies and DC. After all, DC is just very low frequency. So if I try and turn this thing with a constant force, once the inductor spins up, then it's basically a short circuit and none of that DC signal will get through to the ammeter. An inductor is a bit like a circuit break for high frequency signals. So if I move this thing back and forth quickly, then we do hear it at the ammeter because it doesn't have much an effect on the inductor. To make a low pass filter, you replace the inductor with a capacitor. A capacitor is like a short circuit for high frequencies, but a circuit break for low frequencies. This is an oscillating circuit. If you ever need AC for something in your Spintronics world. Here's a fun story. When I was 18, I wrote a scientific paper and got it published in a journal. That sounds more impressive than it actually is. At the time, my physics teacher, Mr. Parkinson, said something like, you know that idea you had I could probably get it published in Physics Education Journal. They have this section for like student submissions. So that's what it was. But I still like to tell people that I got a paper published when I was 18. But the idea was this. If you get a charged capacitor and you connect it directly to an equivalent uncharged capacitor, then half the charge will leave the charged capacitor and end up in the uncharged capacitor. They reach equilibrium with each other. What's surprising is if you calculate the energy of those two capacitors after you connect them, you have exactly half the energy you had before. But where does that energy go? I had this idea that instead of thinking about capacitors, think about tanks of water. So you have one tank of water that's full and another that's empty and it's connected at the bottom with a pipe. When you open that pipe, water will flow from the full tank to the empty tank until they're equal. But actually, because of momentum, there will be an overshoot and the second tank will go slightly above halfway and then it will relax down again and it will oscillate backwards and forwards until they have an equal amount of water in both. But every time the water sloshes backwards and forwards, it loses energy through friction and that's where the energy goes. Electrons in a circuit don't have momentum in a meaningful 
meaningful way, but the wires between the capacitors do have stray inductance. So I wanted to see if the same thing would happen with Spintronics. If I charge up one capacitor and connect it to another, will they oscillate backwards and forwards until they both have half the charge? And will it work with just the stray inductance in Spintronics? And look, there they go. They do oscillate backwards and forwards. Not for long because there's a decent amount of stray resistance in Spintronics as well. But it's nice to have my paper from 1997 validated. What about a full bridge rectifier? Can we make one of those? A full bridge rectifier converts AC to DC with four diodes. As you can see here, as I supply AC here, you get DC at the load here. It's not very smooth, but you can fix that with a couple of capacitors. I only have two diodes, which is why I'm showing you this in simulation. But luckily with Spintronics, you can make a full bridge rectifier with just two diodes. The reason you can do it with Spintronics, but not with regular electric circuits, is because with Spintronics, it's really easy to change the direction of current, which isn't in normal circuits. Depending on how you chain up a junction, you can flip the direction of current flow. What about computation? Could we use this to build a computer of some kind? Well, look, here's a flip-flop. When I turn this switch on, it registers at this voltmeter, but when I switch it off, the voltmeter stays on. This switch puts the voltmeter back to zero, and so I can flip-flop between the two. This is an XOR logic gate. If switch one is on, we get a reading at the ammeter. If switch two is on, we get a reading at the ammeter. But if both switches are on, we don't. So maybe we could use this stuff to build a binary adder like I did with my water computer video. If I ever get that working, I'll make a follow-up. But in the meantime, is there anything I've missed? Is there a really cool circuit that you would like to see built with Spintronics? Let me know in the comments. Thanks to Paul from Spintronics for all his help with this video. And thanks to Mr. Parkinson for being just a brilliant physics teacher. VPNs can be really useful. I recommend the one I use, Private Internet Access. They're sponsoring this video. A VPN encrypts your web traffic and hides your IP address. Without a VPN, your internet service provider, network administrator, and potentially your government, depending on where you live, can see and record the websites you visit. Probably not the content of the websites you visit because that's encrypted with SSL usually, but typically they can see the domain names and build up a profile of you. With Private Internet Access, None of that can happen. And so your digital life is safer and more private. Here's another use case. I was in Spain at the end of summer and we wanted to keep watching a show on a streaming service that is notoriously difficult to get working abroad, even with a VPN. And it worked flawlessly with private internet access. One thing I found quite annoying when I was in Spain was trying to do any kind of home-based admin, like trying to buy something to be delivered to the UK, for example, was really hard because websites were always redirecting me to the Spanish version. I can't speak or read Spanish. Like if you have any kind of home admin to do while traveling, it can be insanely useful to trick your device into thinking you are at home. When you connect your device to a VPN, you can choose which country it appears to be in. And with private internet access, you can choose from over 83 countries and every single US state. They also have a no log policy that's been tested in court and recently verified by an independent audit. But the reason I choose PIA is because all their software is open source. Like I'm not suggesting that everyone who uses private internet access should audit the software on GitHub, but it is out there. So people have audited it. It's a level of transparency that I value. You. The deal on this one's really good. If you go to my special URL, piavpn.com forward slash Steve Mould, you'll get 82% off. That's just $2.11 a month, and you get three months free on top of that. With one subscription, you can protect up to 10 devices. And since it comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee and 24-7 customer support, you can try it out risk-free. The link is also in the description, so check out Private Internet Access today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe. And the algorithm thinks you'll enjoy this video next.